Hey, how are you? Okay, good morning. 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 Okay, we're going to be jumping around to a number of scriptures. We'll open first off in Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Seven, and this week we're looking at saved and baptized church membership for Baptist Distinctive. Uh, we are almost to the end. Uh, the next few are going to be multiple week. Uh, when we look at two ordinances following this one, uh, we'll probably take a week on each and then on separation. That's going to be a little, we could probably summarize that one in just one, but it's going to end up being in three portions that we'll be looking at. Um, so this week, saved, baptized, church membership. So what makes this a Baptist distinctive? Why is this unique to Baptists and not to any other, I guess, uh, denominational church or mainline church as we would know it? What, what separates, why is it that the Baptists hold to this? Why is it, you know, why, why is this like, why is it a big deal? What? Is that a question? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have asked more clearly. Okay, why, why is that the case? Why, is it, why do you think that is? That, uh, Most of the other churches have some sort of a, a curriculum or uh, that you have to go through or a covenant that you have to swear to or memorize. It's, 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 it, it, does, it, it maybe implies salvation sometimes, but not necessarily. I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and I had to learn the shorter catechism uh, when I was 12 years old. And I wasn't saved, but I became a church member. Okay. Um, most, I'd say almost three quarters. Well, yeah, most most any mainline denomination came from the Catholics. They broke away. They they were part of the Protestant Reformation. So any Lutherans, Presbyterians, and anything that would branch off from that, and they all carried the same format as what the Catholics did, because originally they didn't want. To, they just wanted to reform. Catholicism. Uh, they didn't really see a problem with it outside of a number. Well, in Luther's case, it was 99 issues that he had with it. Uh, and then Calvin and a few of the others had maybe a few others or a little less. But nevertheless, they still carried the same format. And so when you see or read about their history uh, in Europe, uh, they conducted themselves the same way as the Catholic Church would have. And then that carried over. Uh, with what was brought over here to the U.S. Well, it would have been the colonies at the time, uh, so we weren't, we weren't a country yet. And so anything that would have stemmed from that carried the same background. And the main error with them was that when you're born, as with uh, pretty much in Judaism or uh, Muslim belief, that you're, you're born into the church. Well, they don't have church. They, they would have their, mm -hmm. their faith congregation, but as far as with, uh, with the Jews, that uh, you're a child of the covenant, and then you're circumcised on the eighth day, and so you're a part of Israel. Uh, and it's your belief comes at basically at any time as far as that you decide to go ahead and believe on Messiah. Um, but you are a part of you're a part of that group. So they they would have carried on in the same way. So the biggest distinction then would be infant baptism versus believer baptism. Uh, in part, the in part, the that that is part of it. Uh, but they were considered part of the local assembly. In other words, you are uh, an actual member uh, uh, of, of the local assembly. Whereas <clears throat> we'll see from scripture this morning, it's going to be a little redundant, uh, just because it was. <laughs> it's that's just the way the material laid out is that everyone that came to Christ. The pattern that they showed was that they joined themselves to the local believers. Mm -hmm. And so we will see from Scripture that uh, anybody that would come to know Christ, they would join themselves to the believers and then they were cared for. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, usually baptism immediately followed that. Uh, so that, were, that wasn't really much of an issue. And we'll discuss that more in, uh, next week when we're doing about baptism. We'll actually discuss it some now. 
Okay, so church membership refers to the voluntary joining of oneself to a local body of believers. Okay, so um, we are going to address, okay, upon salvation, one is automatically a part of the body of Christ. I'm going to make a distinction there. Okay, the body uh, of Christ is twofold. Okay, you have God's body, of which everyone that is born again from the time that, uh, well, from the time of Pentecost till present day and even until whenever Christ returns, uh, even future yet, is a part of. And then you have uh, the local assembly, the local expression of God's body, which is your, your local church. Um, so you have twofold. Now, the local expression, um, say, from what we would have read, well, what we're going to read in Scripture, as far as the church at Jerusalem, is it still there? What? There's a, there is a Christian church in Jerusalem. Yes. Is it the same one that was founded by uh, Peter? And no. Probably not. No. The, uh, <laughs> there would be no way to tie it back as far as that is concerned, but you do have believers that are there, so they are part of God's body. Okay, so I couldn't say that, you know, I don't have a direct link, but we do as far as with regard to, spiritually we do, because we have the same gospel that they preached. Uh, we have recorded uh, for us, preserved uh, forever, uh, you know, God's word and God's teaching. And so anybody that anywhere that picks up a Bible, hears a gospel, believes on Christ, boom, you know, you're grafted into the family. Uh, you're adopted in. And so that's, that's as much your heritage, even if you have no physical tie to it whatsoever, uh, as it is as somebody that was actually, you know, blood-related to, I guess you could say, Peter's or uh, any of the other apostles' uh, bloodline. So, uh, brother, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've been through, I think I've seen every one of these, I've been to every one of these classes, and I think it would be great if you could put together a review, maybe put all, put all your notes, all your PowerPoint notes together into a little booklet uh, on Baptist distinctives. It might be good. There, there might be something else out there that you could use as a substitute, but it would be good to have something that we could review what you said and maybe... You can do it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. How are you doing? Like a, okay. You got the notes. Why do you do it? For? <laughs> no, I can I can do that. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll work on that then. So uh, if not by next week, then Lord willing, week after, we should be able to have something that uh, you guys can have printed out. Where, uh, well, fill in the blank. Would that be fine or no? Or no, you just no, have just, okay. Just, just read the notes. Down. Okay. All right. Hi. Good morning. We are in Matthew 16. Okay, so church membership refers to voluntary joining of oneself to the local body of believers, and then upon salvation, one is automatically part of the body of Christ. In Matthew 16, where I get you, where I had you all open to, Matthew 16. Um, we'll go to verse 13. It says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Jesus, or excuse me, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is a little bit unique, because up to this point, Jesus had only been basically preaching about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand, as what uh, John the Baptist had come to him. Or actually not come to him, but rather he had come uh, to Israel, and then had been a forerunner of Christ, teaching, okay, kingdom of God is at hand. And so everybody's looking to Christ he is obviously he's Christ and then so they're expecting as far as what had been predicted about Christ and that is that he's supposed to rule reign in Israel right he's supposed to be the one that not only delivers Israel but he's supposed to take over as king but they generally were overlooking the fact 
that he was supposed to be cut off, as we're told in Isaiah 53, and as well that he was to die for the sins of the people, not for his own sins, but rather for the sins of the people, uh, to make atonement, and then he would, his once and for all sacrifice would be able to give access to those that would believe on him, and also that those that believe on him, uh, direct access to God. Uh, we see that following his death and then the, uh, the resurrection, the uh, veil was rent in two, uh, and you know, uh, earthquake. Uh, three days later, he's risen from the dead, and then he appears, and he's with the disciples there uh, in Jerusalem for 40 days, teaching about the kingdom of God. Now, towards the end of that, uh, go to, well, we'll go to Matthew 28, Matthew 28, and then Luke 24. Matthew 28, 18. Well, actually, he's 16. Okay, and then the 11 disciples went into, went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even until the end of the world. Amen. Uh, Luke... 24. <coughs> uh, so Verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Uh, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send you um, the promise of my Father, or excuse me, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be dued with power from on high. Uh, we're going to see that repeated again in Acts chapter 1, when he tells them that, uh, well, he tells them that they should tarry here in Jerusalem until the promise of the Father He's taken up from them uh, into the cloud in their sight. Uh, you have the angels that approach them and say to them, you know, why standing here gazing the same Jesus which you've seen, you know, basically risen up is going to come in like manner uh, in order to get, get to work. And then uh, following that, uh, they're gathered. You have 120 of the disciples that are gathered in an upper room. And then they go ahead and they make a they cast lots to go ahead and choose who's going to be the one that uh, to fill uh, Judas' spot. Then, not but ten days later, basically, you have Pentecost, at which time Holy Ghost comes down. They are now empowered. The promise of the Father has come, and then they go forth, and then Peter preaches. We see 3,000 souls get born again at that point. Um, Then go to Acts chapter 2, Acts 2. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And then fear came upon 
every soul and many signs and uh, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men and every man uh, as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking of uh, breaking bread from house to house. They eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, note in verse 41 and then 42. Uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I know we're kind of like just jumping into the, the, the middle of the context there or towards the end of the context, but what are the antecedents for those uh, pronouns? Receive where it speaks of... Uh, they have to receive the word, so infant baptism can't work there. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Um, they, they that gladly received the word, who was that? Who were the they? Who was the they referring to? I know we... The believers that heard the gospel, they have to hear the gospel first and then respond to it. Yeah, and the crowd that was antagonistic to Jesus initially that was responsible for crucifying the ones that were yelling, you know, crucify him and such, uh, they were pricked in their heart. If we were to go back earlier to verse 38 and such, Peter had been pre Well, actually, we go back to the beginning of the chapter. We'll see that Peter had been preaching to them. Um, verse 37, it says, When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said unto Peter, uh, and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter says unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, uh, in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this is it's a crowd of people that were gathered there from many nations. They were all Jewish. Okay, so the, it's part of the the, the diaspora. In other words, the, the, the ones that were scattered, that scattered about Jews, um, and they spoke many different languages. Uh, this this crowd of people that were antagonistic to Christ. Now they're convicted of the fact that, hey, we were responsible for you know, putting death to Messiah. What do we do? They, th this group became believers. And it was about, it says there that uh, 3,000, and they were added unto them. Now who's that them, that second them that we're referring to, that was added unto? Those were the ones that were, uh, re received the Holy Ghost in the room and I, I think one of the things we don't want to skip over here in Matthew 20, 16 and 18, it says Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, unto thee I'll give the keys to the kingdom. And it's not to, the, not to the disciples, it's to Peter alone. And the Catholics take that to mean that Peter is the Pope. But what I take it to mean, I think this is right, in verse 15 of chapter 1, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and, he, and he's addressing the church there and uh, they brought in Matthias as the uh, as the twelfth uh, disciple after after Judas, and that was the point where the Holy Ghost came upon the church. So Peter was the one that was leading the church at that time, when the disciples all received the Holy Ghost. And I believe that was the keys to the kingdom. You could also argue maybe in chapter two where he gets up and preaches, and there are three thousand people added to the church. But that was the founding of the church, and Peter was the one who founded the Jerusalem the Jerusalem church. Uh, but I think we need to be really careful there that we make that distinction because the Catholics will say, well, then the Peter became the first pope, and the, the Catholic Church wasn't even around then. So, it's, no, I wasn't. so uh, that's I run into that a lot in dealing with, with with my daughter, and it's something that I need to really have a clear picture of in my mind. Yeah. The other thing, I'm yeah, sorry. I used to be Catholic too. Uh, they'll say that Peter is the rock, but really the rock is the confession. Yes. Who yes. Jesus is. Yes. Not. Yes. That. Yeah. Because it's. It, 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 but he says in the Greek, in the, the next verse, he says, "I give unto thee the keys of the kingdom," and that's what I was talking about. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. The the rock is Christ. Mm -hmm. Um. And then the issue that you would have <laughs> with regard to if you wanted to say that Peter was the first pope, he doesn't give, or actually nowhere in Scripture does it give any as far as with regard to delegation or continuance, I guess you could say, of his apostolic powers or authority. In other words, when in Ephesians 4, we're told that uh, we're built upon the foundation, the chief, you know, Christ being the chief cornerstone, and then uh, 
the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Um, once the prophet, or excuse me, once the apostles already died off, there wasn't anybody else that carried on, except for believers that took the word of God that was preserved. And so this is our apostles and prophets right here, not not another human man that claims to be, you know, I'm an apostle. We'll see that as well, like in Acts one. Well, actually, the uh, in Acts one, whenever they uh, voted in for Matthias, that they gave some criteria. It would have been somebody that would have accompanied with them. So nobody present day is going to have been alive during that time. So it's, it's not possible for that to have been the case. Um, okay, so the 41 added unto them. So the 120 that were gathered in the upper room, you got 3,000 that was added unto them. And then <coughs> they, now that they, they all continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. So now you have these individuals that were, they believed, and then they were baptized. There wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't any argument about that. Now, we're going to make this distinction a little bit, uh, we're going to be more in-depth about it next week because we're covering specifically about baptism, but why... Why is that important? What What's the big deal with that? Of the profession. Yes. It's kind of, uh, for me, the easiest way to remember, it's uh, if a person that's married, you know, they wear their wedding ring. Or at least they should. Uh, I understand if you're working around machinery. <laughs> I used to work on aircraft, and then that was one of the things that you wouldn't want to have any watches or anything, because the thing is, it's easy to get your hand caught up in something, and then, you know, you can lose a finger. Uh, you know, or the, you know, lose your hand or whatnot. But the um, thing is, if you're wearing a wedding ring, it's pretty much, hey, I'm, I'm married. It's a declaration. So with baptism, it's a declaration. One, Jesus has saved me. I'm born again. You know, I want to make a public confession of the fact that God has saved me. He saved my soul from eternal hell. And then two, also, uh, is the fact that, hey, I want to live for God. You know, uh, we're buried with him in baptism and then raised to walk in newness of life. I have new life now, and I want to live in light of that fact. I want to live for God now. Uh, even though previous life would have been total mess, anti-God as such, uh, the fact is now that I've come to know him, I want to live for him. And so it's, it's a just public declaration. And so they, that was never really an issue. Uh, but again, we'll see more about that uh, next week. voluntarily join a church. Yes. I was on a hilltop in Wyoming and I said, Jesus saved me because my mother was praying for me and I came under conviction. And I had a choice, heaven or hell. And I was scared. And I wanted, I said, I was scared. And I said, Jesus saved me. There wasn't no church around, no church members, nothing. But the Holy Spirit came into me and I became part of the body of Christ right then. Amen, yeah. Then I come back home and all the Jehovah Witnesses and everybody in the world, the devil's trying to keep you from being learning and doing winning souls and and then you uh, pray about it and the Lord sent my wife and I got married and finally found a church that it was a Baptist church and it taught how to win souls and, and it taught to be baptized but our old rebellious state oh, I don't need to be baptized you know we, we got we don't like authority even if the church should tell us what we need to do you know and you can sit here and say well this is just Baptist theory but it's it's authority of the word of God what teaches us and I got baptized, and, and we were taught to win souls. And uh, so it just doesn't happen all at once. But we didn't become a member of the church until we got baptized. We didn't. We weren't sure that we wanted to do that until. Because you know what? Because the devil doesn't want you to serve. You know? That's true. Yeah. And so this is a local church here. And I've got my local church at home, but I've got all these body of Christ people that are my brothers and sisters in Christ in this church. And usually, if I look for Baptists, I can find that. But anymore, not very, not so. There's a lot of Baptist churches that aren't even preaching for the God. Yeah, it's you true. can't even go by that. But really, I think Ryan would say, "I'm not ashamed to be a Baptist because we know what Baptists stand for." But, but anymore, that's kind of falling apart. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, the joining of oneself to a church has always been, like you just stated, 
voluntary choice. No one's forced into it. You're not born into it. The fact is, the same way as salvation has always been a conscious decision made by an individual. Um, and that's the way God has always, uh, likewise, church membership. In fact, yes? I have a friend, in fact, I was just talking to her the other day, and she's looking for a church. And she went to a Baptist church, and she's already a Christian, been baptized. And they said, if you want to become part of the church, you have to be baptized, even though she was already. So you don't have to. I mean, why would they want her to be baptized again? Was it scripturally? But she's been baptized. Um, another church. Another okay. Church. No. What was the baptism scriptural? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is, okay, did they, when she was baptized, was she like dunked underwater? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, then that just might be just particular to them. Some churches operate that they have in their constitution that if you want to become a member, then you have to be baptized in. Uh, other churches are a little bit more lenient as far as like, hey, you have uh, what they call a statement of faith. In other words, if you have a church that you were a part of that was maybe of like faith, uh, they wouldn't have had been, I guess, maybe 100% equal to them. But as far as like, you know, do you believe in salvation by faith? So um, with regard to salvation, you know, is it just by Jesus alone or and not of works? And then <coughs> as far as baptism, if it's like dunking, where you're, you're immersed under the water, uh, that would be legit. I would consider that legitimate because that's that's what shows in scripture, yeah. and then that would be accepted. Uh, but some churches, as far as that might just be particular to <coughs> that local congregation, as far as safety. Yes, I think I think that's that's a case where we become too exclusive. If we if if we take that position as a church that we can't accept somebody that's been believed and that's been baptized somewhere else and believed in Jesus. Uh, take their word for it. I mean, I think we get to the point where we're just, it's like double separation. And we're, we're separating ourselves from believers that we shouldn't be. Yeah. Yes. She won't go back there because of that. I, I actually would kind of find that weird. Um, we're going to touch upon that here some. Um, you know, baptism has always been a conscious decision made following by salvation. So again, it's not going to be an infant that's against their will. Or actually, they're not even aware of what's going on. Same thing as with an infant coming in. And then, um, okay, no, no individual is forced to follow God's plan for their life. Okay, so anything that is regard to walking, living for God, uh, walking in the Spirit, it's always an appeal to the will. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you don't have responsibility, that God won't put, um, He won't chastise and those kinds of things, but rather, there's no human effort to go ahead and force somebody. In other words, coerce, there's no coercion involved. <coughs> and, okay, some practical considerations that I had, and that is wheat and tares, wheat and tares, okay? Go to Matthew 13, <coughs> and then we're gonna go to Acts chapter 20 following that. Matthew 13 and Acts chapter 20. Starting in verse uh, 24, verse 24. This is Christ speaking to his disciples, and he's giving the parable. Okay, another parable put he forth and, uh, unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in 
to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so here he's giving an illustration, and he's giving a parable with regard to uh, wheat and tares. So one's a weed, one's an actual good product. And so he says that there's going to be a mix of the two, and he doesn't want to damage the good product um, from pulling out the weeds, uh, lest you know this could be damaged. That be done. Go to Acts 20. Acts 20. And then from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, is speaking of Paul, and called the elders of the church. And when they came, uh, and then when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me of, excuse me, by the lying and weight of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, uh, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me, save the Holy Ghost with us uh, in every city, saying uh, that bonds and afflictions um, abide me. But none of these things move me, neither kind of my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which is, or which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, <coughs> that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Okay, therefore watch and remember. Uh, we'll stop there. Wheat and tares. He says that there's going to be grievous wolves that are going to come in, and then he says, also of your own selves. Now, mind you, who's he speaking to here? Who's his audience? The church. He, well, and particularly the Ephesian elders. Yeah, church, but it's the, it's the pastors, the leadership of, of, of the churches there in Ephesus. And so you would think, okay, wow, wait a minute. <laughs> How are these guys, the ones that are going to be leading us, going to be the ones that are going to turn? I mean, not all of them, but there's going to be some of them that are going to turn. He says, uh, and they're gonna. How's he put it here? He says that um, they're gonna speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Okay, so they get to twist uh, God's word so that they could get a following after themselves. And besides the grievous wolves that are gonna already be coming in, so take heed. Um, As much as I would love to be able to go ahead and say that, hey, there's a hundred percent like purity, uh, and again, that, that that does not diminish our responsibility to be alert and aware. Okay, that does not uh, negate the fact that we have to be ever conscious as far as with regard to our own selves, and uh, you know, obviously, the conduct of others that are around us. Uh, the fact is. God did say, okay, there are going to be some that are going to infiltrate. There are going to be grievous wolves that come in from outside, and there's also going to be some that turn away from among your own selves. Uh, I don't know, honestly, here who's pointing in. Because, and again, uh, I know I'm born again because I've trusted Christ. Uh, and all I have to go by is a person's confession of faith, their testimony as far as whether or not you know, um, they proclaim whether or not they've trusted Christ or not for their salvation. But I don't know their heart. I can't look upon their heart. I don't know, you know. Uh, I can look on their actions, 
but even then, the fact is I can be fooled. Uh, so I, again, I don't know who's, who's a believer who's not. Now, we should obviously strive for purity. We want to have uh, holiness, because that's, that's what God's striving for. And the fact is, it's, it's his glory that we're working towards. But uh, the fact is, I don't know <laughs> who's going to heaven or not. All I have to go by is a, what a person tells me. And again, I'm limited because I'm human. I can't look into a person's heart. Uh, so I, you know, you just go by what their testimony is. Now again, that doesn't mean that you don't have regulation in place with regard to conduct. Uh, you know, everybody should abide by conduct. We should strive to be holy. Uh, you don't want to allow wickedness to go run rampant in a church because that is, I mean, that's God's God's plan. Not the wickedness run rampant, but rather that we should, you know, we should be a light unto the world. Uh, and you know, even even our sanctification—that's God's will. Uh, we're told in First Thessalonians. Uh, uh, but the fact is, at the end of the day, you know, and then God knows, you know, whether you're born again or not. Uh, second consideration: okay, uh, God's glory is our ultimate goal. God's glory is our ultimate goal. Uh, we have. Um, well, okay. God's glorified in many ways, but ultimately, primarily, it's going to be by our, our faithful obedience. We should seek to live by faith, and we should seek to lovingly obey uh, His commands. In that, Christ said He's the one that's going to be. Um, well, I guess touching upon this is going to touch upon a little bit on our third point. He's the one that's going to build the church. I, I need His strength and His power. Now we're obviously delegated a responsibility. We're told to go into all the world preach a gospel to every creature. We're supposed to go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the world, be witnesses unto him, uh, and then you know teach them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us. So that's that's us. He's entrusted us uh, with the ministry of reconciliation and also the word of reconciliation. So we should seek to faithfully carry that out. Uh, but the fact is I need him, I need his power, I can't do that in my own strength. Uh, that's too great a task. Uh, and it's 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 a supernatural thing, really, because the fact is, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts men of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. And again, it doesn't negate my responsibility to be knowledgeable of the Word, to go forth, uh, to pray for people, to intercede, to uh, to confront them with truth. But the fact is, I need God's I need God's strength, I need God's power, and ultimately, it's His glory uh, that we're working towards. No, chucking that question. Yes. Uh, when uh, the Lord is in control of our life, but people can tell, other Christians can tell that. So, uh, you know, people that are not in fellowship with the Lord, you can't tell. You, know, you just have to go by their word. But when you, a person's heart's right with the Lord, and they're serving the Lord, doing the, obeying the Lord, you can tell that they do. They're, uh, is real. They're real. Yeah, when a person's obedient, and you see the fruits of the spirit in their life, God's love, uh, you can definitely tell your spirit their witness with their spirit. Yeah, a person that's not being obedient, faithful to the word, or living out, then that makes it kind of difficult. Yeah. You, you, you can only really just go yeah. off on their word. Um, with regard to that, also we should admonish one another. Uh, to provoke unto love and the good works. Uh, in other words, a believer that is not, you know, they come to be a believer, but they're not walking right. Uh, we're to come alongside. Uh, basically, hey, look, listen, this, this your life, <laughs> your your life, you know, you've been given new life, and it's when you stand before God, you know, it's going to be waste, and so we, you know, that's what we want admonish them with regard to the fact is it's like don't waste your life don't waste it living for the flesh don't waste it living for yourself um, for this world uh, this third consideration practical consideration Christ builds his church uh, I don't know if you have can y'all read some of that or no I know it's kind of small letter it's like the trail of blood okay is it from the trail of blood yes it is okay, okay. it's a chart from the trail of blood <laughs> The bottom should have something about the Anabaptists, right? Yes. Because okay, so you have all densities. Starting roughly around 100 AD, 
moving forward to, I guess you could say, present day. And so you have Christians. The chart kind of lays out as far as historically what would be considered your Baptistic groups, even though they would have called themselves Baptists. Uh, it would just be basically Bible believers. And then you have where around 313 Catholic Church starts, and then all the branches off of that. And so now there's no direct link. I'll just put that. There's no direct link to back to Peter. All right, we don't have that. Nobody has that. Well, God does, but we don't. You know, I can't say, okay, this is such and such from this, you know, this age. But the fact is, all through the ages, there's always been believers that have taken the word of God, sought to live it out, and then carried out his commands. Uh, and they were called by many different names. You know, usually they just sought to seek, you know, to live a quiet and peaceable life, uh, being trying to be obedient to the word of God. And quite often they were persecuted, uh, run into caves, and uh, actually a number of them fled over here to the New World and then started fresh here in the New World. But uh, there's always going to be believers. Uh, Christ is always going to build his church, and he's the one that's building it, not, again, us. That's not to, de to negate our responsibility, but he's the one that's going to carry out. And we need to seek to be faithful uh, in, in being, one, taking heed to ourselves, first off, uh, that we are right, uh, so that we continue to be right, and then we can propagate truth uh, to others. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. I think the most important thing when you, as a brother over here visiting at independent churches, when you go into the church, are they winning souls? Are they are they bringing people into into Christ? I mean, if you're going to a church, it might be 400 people, and they only get one or two people saved a year. I'd like to be in a church that has 12 that gets 20 saved. Yeah. A, a big church. I mean, that's you know, whether they think she's not baptized right or something, that doesn't matter. It's that they're winning souls and they're bringing others. That's our, that's our <coughs> mission is to start other churches and go out into the world and win souls. That's, yeah. that's our purpose. We're here. We're saved. What's our purpose? Being here? That's right. Win souls. Next week we'll be looking at two ordinances. So uh, we're discussing. So.